He is. Bless you, brother. Some of you thought, what are we going to do a few years ago, huh? God knows more than you do. Knows more than I do, too. I had the same question. Lord, what are we going to do? We can't make it. God always knows more than we do. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for getting out of your comfort zone. He is getting better. Singing, singing, singing for the glory of God. What a blessing. Thankful for him. Thankful for him. Your Bible's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Be praying for me tomorrow as I travel to Pikeville, Kentucky. Got to be up there by dinner time. Pikeville's about as far as you can go. It's right up there on the line. That's where the Kentucky Baptist Convention will be on Tuesday. I've been elected to serve on the state executive board, so I will be meeting tomorrow afternoon with our state workers and serving on the finance committee of our state. So pray for me as I travel and get there for the meeting. And then pray for Sean Abram. Brother Sean will be preaching tomorrow afternoon as a evangelist to the Kentucky Baptist Convention. Uh, he's speaking behind Bob Pittman. Anybody knows Bob? He's one of my favorite speakers. Bob Pittman's been a long time, 30 plus year pastor of Kirby Woods Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He's a fantastic and he has uh, been one of the supporting churches of Binghampton Community Church and that's where Sean's tied in, I believe, tomorrow as he'll be preaching uh, following uh, Bob Pittman and it'll be a good pastor's conference. Be praying for that tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night. I'll miss some of it tomorrow afternoon as I'll be in state meetings with the executive board but then we will go over in the evening and then be there for Tuesday's convention. So be much in prayer. We also now have the opportunity that our executive director Paul Chitwood has been unanimous, unanimously nominated to serve as the new uh, International Mission Board President. So it looks like our Executive Director Paul Chitwood will be leaving us in Kentucky Baptist life. He's been a Kentucky Baptist pastor for many years and now serving as our State Executive Director and he'll be serving the International Mission Board as their Director. It's a big position as we are the largest mission force across the world today. I know I tell you that of any denomination. We are not the largest giver to charities. I keep saying that so you don't take me out of context, but we are the largest mission board entity in the world. Over 4,700 missionaries serving on foreign soil that we as Southern Baptists support as souls are changed, their lives are being changed across the world and we thank God for that. So pray for uh, Dr. Chitwood as he goes. He's a great guy. I've enjoyed serving with him and under him. Very personable guy and and uh, pray God to use him for the International Mission Board as he goes to Atlanta and serves in that capacity. And pray for his family. It's just been recently, his wife is a school teacher. She is a uh, victorious uh, in her life with breast cancer. Uh, and, and God has blessed her. And after that, they became foster parents uh, in the foster system here in Kentucky. As Kentucky Baptist is the largest uh, orphan group in the state of Kentucky and now we are the largest uh, in foster care throughout the state of Kentucky uh, making sure those children are cared for in Kentucky. That's one of the specific things Jesus said, take care of the orphans, take care of the little children and so I'm proud that Kentucky Baptist has been doing that for a long time and, and the laws are changing where we can't keep them in homes like we've done for years and years. I'm talking about children's homes but now we moved in to the foster care system because the laws allow us to do that and to place them. So that's why we've moved in that direction and, and had the largest group out there. So praise the Lord for that. You pray for the Chitwoods. This morning I speak to you on what we should do with the gospel. What we should do with the gospel. I presented a message to you about my concern for lostness in Hopkins County. My, my concern for lostness in Webster County. And, and I'm still concerned about lostness in Hopkins in Webster County. I, I believe there's a lot of people going around saying they're Christians, but they're not. I believe there's a lot of people saying, yes, I, I know Jesus.
Jesus, but they know His name and they know where He's at, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. We're living in a world today where the language is changing. The language among people are changing. Something that meant one thing back 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20, is not the same meaning today. And you'll see as I begin my message this morning of what I talk about. Something's happening in America and to America right now. In fact, it's, it's actually happening to the uh, once Christianized Western world. Whether you get your news from television or whether you get your news from online, the, the information's the same. Everything's changing. You know, we was in the satellite age. We're here in the cable age. And now there's Hulu and Sulu and I don't even know all the names. I can't even begin to tell you the TV things. And you stream live and watch television. I, I'm having to buy a new TV come up pretty soon. I've got to get a smart TV, you know. I already thought it was smart enough, but now i got to have a smart TV that gets things just a little bit different. I think I'm fixing to get rid of satellite and maybe uh, do some things in a different way. Uh, recently, my wife and I uh, had the antenna turned on in the camper, and we got all these digital television stations, 14, 25, 44, and I'm like, wow, you get all these for free, you know, and now we're paying a fortune. I'm like, dude, I got to change this, and so I start sharing it. Well, Brother Gary, we've been doing this forever. Don't you know what Hulu is? I know what a hula skirt is and a hula hoop, amen? Anybody with me? Did I say Hulu right anyway? Isn't that this thing where you can stream and get them? Hulu, some of the little kids back there, two, second grade. Yeah, that's it, preacher, that's it. That's it, yeah. I'm checking this stuff out. We're, we're living in a different age today. The United States is no longer the country she was. It's shocking to compare the worldview of today's generation with the one embraced by older generations, even here in the Western culture. America has the largest number of Christian churches. America has the largest number of Christian colleges. America has the largest number of Christian seminaries. America has the largest Christian resources in the world and largest media in the world, Christian media in the world. Yet, her values and predominant worldview demonstrate that America is changing. Western civilization as a whole is less Christian than it used to be. I mean, we're watching relativism. Moral relativism is, is spreading throughout the West. It, it's a terrible thing. Uh, we have a disease going on in the world today. There's even an ideological civil war being waged in America. Moral relativism is, is having greater national acceptance and people are becoming more tolerant. Tolerant is a key word today. Pastor, be careful what you say. You don't want to offend someone. I, I'm not having that problem, I don't think. <laughs> but some still throw it out there occasionally. Terminology uh, uh, is, is changing. One of the big things you're coming up on right now as you understand what I'm trying to talk about is no longer is it acceptable throughout America to say Merry Christmas. Huh? Is this not true among businesses? Is this not true among society? The key word and the tolerable word to use today is Happy Holidays. I don't use Happy Holidays, and those that use it with me, I usually correct them. That's, like I said, I don't have a problem offending some people. Well, I have to do it. No, well, do you? Do you have to? Well, that's what they tell me to do. Well, that's, it's acceptable that we do these things. I don't know about you, but I'm going to use Merry Christmas. I don't care whether you think it has anything to do with it or not, but I believe that Satan wants to take Christ out of everything he can in America. It's a holiday tree now. I don't have a holiday tree. I got a Christmas tree. That's what it is. It's a Christmas tree, not a holiday tree. 
I don't celebrate, I celebrate lots of holidays and I don't leave the tree up and change the de decorations. What's on my tree is Christmas decorations. And that's what it's going to be in my home, is a Christmas tree. We're progressively moving away from Christianity. I mean, think about us as Christians. Nativity scenes are not allowed on courthouse squares. Where's the Civil War? Why don't we raise Cain about it? Why don't we go to the courthouse? Because people say, is it worth it? Even some of you as I speak about this is, is it worth it? Well, let me tell you something. It's worth it. Because by taking the nativity scenes away, they're taking Christ out of the picture of Christmas. Because the nativity scene is nothing else than a picture of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And now we no longer have nativity scenes in public. The Ten Commandments have been removed. Prayer is not accepted in many places. I'm thankful for where I still live. I was invited to Hanson School to stand outside around the flagpole and pray with those beautiful children, those gracious, loving teachers that love Jesus and call on the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that we can still do that. Many of our schools did it, if not all. I'm thankful to live in a country, to live in a county where that's still acceptable. But guess what? Many of my family live in many states that they couldn't pray around the flagpole if they had to. And if you do it, you go do it quietly and you don't announce it and you spread the word because they can't stop you and you do it real quick so nobody can come out to the flagpole and disperse you. This is the kind of country we live in today. Crosses are disappearing off of properties because they say the cross is offensive. Well, see, it's a terrible thing. And me as a Christian, it's offensive for me for the cross to be taken down. But I'm supposed to be tolerant. And shh, don't offend them. God help us today. Christianity's influence is slowly being purged from our nat national conscience, our conscience. Kids do not even know the same things that you and I were, te were taught. We're not having an impact on the culture and those in it today. In fact, we're remaining content and safe within our churches and Christian circles. We're not imparting the gospel in a way the next generation can grasp. In fact, they think it's fake anyway, fake news. When I grew up, if somebody said, the Bible said, if somebody said that when I was a boy, the Bible said, I took that as a what? Fact. Today, you can say the Bible says, and children out there will go, that's not a real storybook. That's not truth. Many, many children, starting at young ages today, God help us, it's a critical moment in the church today. If we don't wake up, recognize the divide, make the necessary gospel resets, we're in trouble. We are seeing a generation or the next generation fall completely away. Church, churches are dying. That's what we're talking about now among the convention is all the churches that are shutting the doors and all the churches that are, are closing of all denominations. Why? They don't even know what the gospel is. In fact, some of us don't know what the gospel is in our lives. We have a worldview secularized through education and culture, and we're divided. We need to understand and we need to take time. America as a culture, the entire Western world, we used to be like the Jews. See, the Jews, when they were taught the Bible, you can go to like Acts. The Acts was driven towards the Jews, and, and Acts was this period of time, and, and Jews had history, and they knew Jesus, and they knew there was a Messiah coming, and so all this was taught the Jewish children. But then if you move on into some of those other books, we go out and deal with the Greeks, and the Greeks thought that Jesus was this other type person and they they followed more of astronomical type followings and in paganism and so if you notice that the writings are different of Peter and Paul in the New Testament because he's talking to a different group see we're talking to a different group today the Bible doesn't even mean the same today you mention the Bible to many children or maybe even mention the word God 
Who is God? And some of the kids may ask, are you talking about, or which God are you talking about? Are you talking about the Muslim God? Are you talking about the Buddhist God? Are you talking about the Hindu God? See, when God was mentioned when I was a child, whether it be in school or not in school, there's only one God that ever came to my mind. And what God was that? Jehovah God. Today it's different. Today it's many gods. And, and even, even so, there's the humanistic view of you're the God. It's within yourself and with a positive attitude, you can overcome anything. Let me tell you something. I don't care what kind of positive attitude I got, I still can't overcome my sin in my life. Amen. It takes the Holy Ghost to God. I fail every time. I've got a great sense of humor and a great attitude and I'm positive and I still if I don't have the Holy Ghost I'm in trouble if you don't have the Holy Ghost you're in trouble it's not about humanism it's not about me I can't become a superhuman I can't become flash Batman my, my, my grandson loves Batman the only problem is he don't know the right music. I know the music. Da 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 da. See, that's it. You know, I can't be Superman and all those other Marvel characters. I don't know them all. I can't be superhuman, but I guess what? Have faith in the superhuman. His name is Jesus, and He can do all things. We live in a different world today. We live in a different society today and, and things are changing. We need to change and remember we're talking to a Greek culture. We're living in a Greek culture. It's not a Christian culture. I believe as churches we need to recognize this and we need to contribute in that direction. Even today millennials speak a different language. I mean, there, there's some of these that we're talking about. The Bible story is, is not a real story. It, it's, it, it's fictitious and it, it's, it's, not, it's not all real. In my time it was. And, and, and yet the language continues to change. I read the story of a missionary that had been over in Australia for a long time and he came back. And when he came back, he noticed that the language has changed. And while he was living in California, he had a problem with his car. And, and, and so uh, uh, he told somebody, you know, he needed help with his car. And they said, what's wrong is your battery flat. Now, he lived in Australia for a long time and words mean different things. And he thought, is my battery flat? He thought, no, it's square. <laughs> What do you mean flat? He said, my battery is dead. Well, it's the same thing. Flat and dead is the same thing. He went, well, you know, I thought flat. He said, where's the petrol station? And the guy said, petrol station? He said, yes, in Australia we go to the petrol station and get fuel for our vehicle. No, you're talking about the gas station. It's just two blocks down the road, turn right. You can't miss it. He said, gas? Why would you put gas? I put liquid in my car. <laughs> Not a gas. When I was reading these statements from a missionary that had been gone for 30, 40 years that came back and had served in another country, even the language is a barrier with people today. And even in the church, language can be a barrier. As we use words to people, sometimes it's embarrassing when, when and, and one of the last things that this missionary said was... Uh, uh, he, he wanted to tell somebody that uh, his wife had had a baby and they were talking and, and he used the word nursing. I'm, I'm nursing our baby. And it got real quiet on the phone because he meant taking care of the baby. But the person on the phone thought he was actually nursing the baby. Or how do you do this? What are you talking about nursing? And he wrote this down and he says, I can't believe how language has become a barrier. 
Even us that live in Kentucky, we have a dialect. And I spoke to a man from Pennsylvania yesterday, and he said, you're from the South, there's no doubt. I can hear it in your voice. I was not dressed in attire. I had camouflage on, and he looked at me, and he said, you sound like you might be a preacher with your voice. It's carrying up and down, and my wife and I is just noticing that. You, are you? I said, I am. I'm a Southern Baptist minister. Oh, my goodness, a denomination that stays with the Word of God, he said. Wow, praise the Lord. He said, we've left the Methodist church in Pennsylvania and gone to the Assembly of God. We don't have hardly any Baptist churches around, but Assembly of God church is there, and they stick with the book. And he said, my wife and I believe in the book. That's the way to go. I thought, wow. What an honor, what a wonderful thing as, as I see. And just yesterday as this guy just met me and we begin to talk. There's a lot of things going on in the world today. There's a lot of change. Now as we talk about the millennials, where are they at? Well, I read this statistic and then I'll move on to the message. It's telling us today that among the millennials, the 30-somethings, they even added that. 61% was churched as a teen or a child and disengaged in their 20s. 61%. It was asked the question among people in their 60s. There's 22% of people that were engaged in church, but now in their 60s, they have left the church. But the millenniums is 22 to 63% difference, a 40% difference in three, two and a half to three generations. Do, do you see where this is headed? Do you see what's going on in life today? We're living in a, a different. Then the question was asked, how do you get to heaven? And among the survey done by Lifeway to people across the street, and this is people in the South. This is not people in those crazy states we want to call them that may believe completely different. This was done in the South. How do you get to heaven? 69% say you get to heaven by being a good person. And a good person is born again. Well, what's born again mean? They had trouble answering that. Wow. I mean, it continued on. They believed in God. And the amazing statistic is 75% said they pray often. They pray often. Wow. What's that tell us? It tells us we're living in a scary time. The gospel. What is the gospel? As you take your Bibles this morning, and what should we do with the gospel? Chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen of, of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. As we take this passage of Scripture, we're talking about the gospel this morning. What we should do with the gospel. There's many statements in the Bible that set forth. You can write these down. You won't have time to turn there. I've got the actual Scripture written here. But what should we do? What's the importance of the gospel? I'm not sure everybody even knows what the gospel is, and, and can they share that? But what is the gospel? What's the importance of it being preached?
preach. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. 2 Timothy 1.11 says, Life and immortality were brought to light by the gospel. Galatians 3.8 says, That the gospel was even preached unto Abraham in Old Testament times. Matthew uh, chapter 11 verse 5, The poor have the gospel preached unto them. Mark 1.15, People were to repent and believe the gospel. The gospel was such that it was worth the disciples losing his life for it and for Christ's sake that he died upon the cross. It is called the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel. It is the gospel of God because it originates in God's love. It's called the gospel of Christ because it flows from the sacrifice of Christ himself and he is the alone object of the gospel faith. Jesus. Only Jesus. We go on. It's the grace of God because it saves by grace all those whom what? The law leaves under a curse. The gospel of the glory because it concerns him who is in glory and who is to bring many sons unto glory. It's the gospel of our salvation because it's the power of God unto uh, salvation to everyone who believes upon it. It's even the gospel of the uncircumcision because it saves entirely apart from any ceremony any legalism, any ordinances approved by man. The gospel. The gospel is above all these things. It's the gospel of peace because through Christ it makes peace between the sinner and God and imparts an inner peace within the soul. I have peace today because peace with God. I know Him as my Lord and Savior. So pastor, what should we do with the gospel? First of all, you need to learn the gospel. You need to learn it. What should you do with it? You need to learn it. It's not that hard. We need to learn just what the gospel really is. For a lot of people do not know the word gospel really means good news. It means good news. So whatever may be of good advice is not good news of the gospel. But the good news is one specific thing. Look in verses 3 or 4 of chapter 15. We read them. I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how Christ died for our sins. Do you realize how many people were crucified on a cross? It was the Romans' number one way to kill people was on the cross. I don't know the astronomical number of hundreds and thousands of people that died upon the cross, but I only know of one man that died upon the cross for our sins. That's it. Only one. History will not say it, but they will say Jesus died on the cross for the remission of sins. Jesus died on the cross for mankind's sin. Wow. So understand that. Look, when we read that verse and, and we see it, He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now that's important because I don't know about you, but I believe the Scriptures is God's holy word. And I believe it's a true book and it's not fake news. I believe the Bible to be God's word, period, and it to be the truth. That separates me because I can read it in the Word and believe it. And I've got confidence. Jesus died upon the cross. He shed His blood according to the Scriptures. That's good enough for Gary. I don't need anything else because I believe the book. He goes on to say, if you look in verse 4, He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus said He was going to rise again the third day. Jesus rose again the third day. They carried His dead body and the soldiers went up to the body and grabbed His feet. They grabbed His arm. They watched blood and water flow from His side as the spear went in. They watched Him die. The Bible says He gave up the ghost. Jesus Christ died a physical death upon the cross. He didn't pass out. He died on the cross. And they carried a lifeless dead body with no life left in it. You ever had a dead body in your arms? I have many. I'll have to say they all were church members and family. 
people that love Jesus, follow Jesus, believed in Jesus. And I can tell you upon seconds, seconds after their last breath, the body changed. There was no life left in that body. It was dead. It was gone. I even touched my own father. I touched his face and his cheeks. I leaned down and kissed my daddy. I told him I loved him. And I looked up and said, what did I do that for? Daddy's not even here. Helped me. But he was gone. It was life. There was no life, Jonathan. Even his cheeks kind of went in within minutes. His forehead changed. His nose changed. And immediately his body temperature changed. When mama left, bam. Why, preacher? To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Amen. Immediately in that second, they were with Jesus in heaven. How do you know? Because the scriptures tell me so. And I believe the scriptures to be the word of God. That's why. But science says this. That's what's happened. We put more emphasis on scientific facts than we do biblical facts. Well, let me tell you, this preacher believes in biblical facts over scientific facts. Amen. Because I believe in a God that's still there in heaven and His Spirit reigns within me. How do you know the Spirit reigns within me? Because I feel Him. I get convicted of Him. He speaks to me. He helps me. He comforts me. We need to learn the gospel. Jesus Christ dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And he rose again the third day. And then look in this chapter. Do you see all the people that he went and presented himself to? And, and guess what? He didn't just present himself to the apostles, the disciples. He went and presented himself to all these other people. He went and presented himself. Why? To make it a fact that Jesus was alive. The Bible says so, but he went and presented himself and the Bible gives it to us. We should learn the gospel, the truth, all that Jesus did, all that he has done, all that he's going to do, all that he's going to do in the future to accomplish the salvation. You know what? Salvation of what? Hell-deserving sinners. I'm a hell-deserving sinner right here. Hody, you're a Baptist preacher. I still deserve hell. I haven't done anything but believe on Jesus to get the gift of God, heaven. I'm a hell-deserving person right here. And the only way I'm worthy today is the blood of Jesus that He shed on Calvary has now upon my life. Even God can look at me now because He doesn't see Gary. He sees His Son's blood upon my life. <laughs> We deserve hell and we need to know what the gospel is. We need to learn it. And we need to understand that Jesus came from His eternal deity and Godhead through the virgin birth of a woman, sinless life ministry. His vicarious death means sacrificially He gave Himself. He died for me. He died for you. And He died for all that would put their faith and trust in Him. Amen. It was that sacrificial, that giving of Himself. His burial and bodily resurrection was to show us that we can rise again one day and bodily we will live for the Lord and live in heaven. Ascend to heaven. Woo! It was a high priest atonement because no more was a sacrifice needed to give. He was the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world and no other sacrifice was ever needed after that. All these are part of the gospel. Do you know the gospel? Learn it. Study it. It's the plan of salvation. Sinners are saved by grace through faith without works of any kind. It's not works that get me to heaven. It's my faith in Jesus knowing I'm a sinner, knowing I'm lost and I'm going to hell and I need Jesus to go to heaven and I ask Him to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. I believe the Bible to be God's holy word and every truth is there and I believe that so I'm believing on Jesus. That's the only way I'm going to get to heaven no other way I try by works and it don't work because I do so many bad ones 
Road rage? Walmart rage? You don't have to say amen. I ain't by myself. I follow y'all into town. Clint and I was making visits Friday. Some woman pulled out in front of me. She pulled right out in front of me. I mean right out. I had to hit the brakes. Clint even kind of went forward a little bit. That's hard to throw a big boy like that. <laughs> I tooted my horn just a little bit, got right up behind her. I couldn't help it. Thought I was going to hit her. She gave me the hillbilly wave. <laughs> Clint, do I push her in the ditch now? <laughs> With this big truck, I think I can do it in one stroke and be taken care of. That's not of God. That's not godly. It's a flesh. 9.45, walk into Walmart. I park over where there's no cars. What, what time's that door supposed to close on that left side? 10, I thought, right? Close the door, 10. They closed at 9.30. Had to walk all the way down the other side, walked in there. One woman run the cash register. The rest of that was self-checkout. I was so furious. Line backed up with that one woman. The woman come to me and said, You can come to self-checkout. There's nobody here. I know it. I don't want to go there. I said, I like to talk to people. Well, I'll talk to you. <laughs> she said, why don't you like to go to Seth Check, Seth Check? I said, because I want people to have their job. She said, ooh, that's a good answer. <laughs> Man, I didn't know if I was supposed to tell her about Jesus because I was so frustrated or not. <laughs> All these things that's in our life... The gospel and the gospel lives with inside of us and we let the devil come in and we let these other things happen. We got to learn it. I'm saved by grace. I'm not worthy of the grace that he gives me. I'm not worthy of the salvation that he has bestowed upon me. I'm not worthy of heaven as a gift of God. But I know and I know that one day I'm going to heaven because I've trusted in Jesus and the blood of Jesus is on my life. Amen. The gospel. We need to be passionate about it. But we're passionate about everything else under the sun. But so am I. Are we passionate about Jesus? Will we make it get that way? But are we really passionate about the gospel? Most times we're more passionate about activities than we are the gospel. Don't take me out of... Listen to what God's trying to say through me today. We're more wanting to be a part of activities, but are we really active in living and sharing the gospel? Because I can go and do all the activities in the world, but the activity's not going to save anybody. But the gospel can and will change your life. It's changed this Richard Center boy. I'm telling you. God used a man from Pennsylvania yesterday to change me. At a campground. Where Lori and I's campers parked. And I go back from hunting there. Don't have to travel all the way back to Hanson. I was having a pity party. I told a Sunday school class. I was having a pity party. I was by myself. Dad's gone. Nephew's busy. My son's after three big boys on a little farm. He's got, so I'm up there by myself and just a little pity party. Come back to the trailer and I was all frustrated and mad. And, oh, poor pitiful me. Sad. Didn't see the big one. I'm tired of this. There's this dude in his fifth wheel camper in front of me and I get out and I got my ATV on the back, my Ranger, and Guy turns around and said, hey! I thought, dude, he's northern. I can already tell with an egg. <laughs> he said, you been ATV in today? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Hadn't been off the darn trailer. Oh! Nice! Nice truck! Nice ATV! Hey! I thought, is this dude from Canada? That's how they talk. Canada, get A on top of everything. He come over, hey, my name's Mike. And my name's Gary. Good to meet you. I gotta hurry up and get some food in me. I'm froze. Hey, 
Hey, what have you been doing? I've been hunting today. Oh, I love to hunt in the great state of Pennsylvania. No, little bitty bucks, everything little. Oh, I bet you got big bucks. I showed him a picture. Oh, let me go show my wife. <laughs> he runs the trailer and brings her out. Turned into 35 minutes. I'm hungry. I'm froze. Here's what God did. God found out that we have land. He said, you're blessed. I traveled to Virginia to my sister's to hunt. You're young and have a camper. You're blessed. You get to hunt on your property. I've never done that. Tell me the feeling. Okay, God, that's enough. You know? Then he said, I said, where are you headed? Well, I'm headed to the ark. I'm going to go see the ark before we go back to Pennsylvania. We've been out west for eight weeks. He said, we're going to see the ark in the Creation Museum. God said, Christian, Christian. Go ahead, Gary, Christian. I heard you, okay? I ain't told him I'm a preacher yet, so... He said, I'm headed. I said, what are you doing here in Central City? He said, I'm going to Bud's. Bud's gun store. I'm an enthusiast. God went, now, keep going, son. Keep going. Y'all right in here. Found out he was a Christian. Found out he loves Jesus. The one met, left the Methodist church, went to the Assembly of God because he believes in the book, he said. That was his words. And then he put his arm upon me and he said... I finally told him, I said, I'm a Southern Baptist minister. Oh, you, you pastor church. How, how, how many churches? You, how long have you been doing this? I said, 30 years, two churches. He said, oh, blessed again. That unheard of. Our stay for two, three years, they're gone. Man, just bam, 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 bam. I said, this may be forward, but could I give you my name? Maybe come back to Kentucky. I hunt with you next year. You don't have to be by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> then I said, <laughs> I'll pray about it. <laughs> then he said, I'll pay you. I said, here's my business card. <laughs> <laughs> Text me or email me. <laughs> Met his wife, spent another 20 minutes. We talked. Heard his story of salvation, his families. Went in the camper and God said, Now, did you hear me? And I said, Yes, sir, I did. Yeah. I heard you, Lord. I did share the gospel. He already knows Christ, living for Jesus. Talked about a satellite church of the one they're in and talking about how they went in and every church member took a chair and prayed over every chair for the person that's going to sit in that chair at the satellite church. And they put 250 chairs in the satellite church that Sunday morning to hear the word of God. And, and he said, Pastor Gary, he said we had 325 people. We had to come up with another 120. 25 chairs. So I heard him share Jesus and I heard the Lord speak to me. And I'm not even done yet, but I'll stop there this morning. The key is, do you know the gospel? Have you learned the gospel? Are you sharing the gospel? We're living in a world where we cannot take for granted that our next door neighbor knows Jesus is in a personal relationship. We, can, we cannot assume that all those kids, you school teachers out there, you are in a mission field. Everybody that works with the public, you are in a mission field. We cannot assume that everybody knows Jesus and knows Jesus died upon the cross and knows that if you're lost, you go to hell. They don't don't know this because they don't even believe the Bible to be a truth of God it's just a storybook what do we got to do well I'll finish next week because the point is we got to go back and lay the foundation the foundation the foundation started one of the greatest problems is we're just giving them icing on the cake and we're not giving them the foundation 
Before you leave here next Sunday, I'm going to pray that you know how to share the gospel. You know the gospel front and back. Because you are encountering people in this world today that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's our families and our friends. Remember, 70 some odd percent said good people go to heaven. What are we doing about the gospel? Jonathan comes this morning and we still give an invitation. I know I'm not done. We give an invitation this morning for you to respond to the call. Because I believe that there's somebody here today. I believe there's one of you here today that's lost. If you was to die today, I believe you would go to hell. You're lost. There's some of you just not sure. I, I'm just not sure, Brother Gary. Why would you leave here today not sure if you could make sure if you're saved or not? Why? Well, I'm embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed? Do you know I've been praying for this service for six days? Six days I've been praying for this service. Six! God, there's going to be people there that are lost and they don't understand the gospel. Don't, don't be ashamed. Just step out and say, I want Jesus. I want Him as my Savior. I want to know where I'm going to spend eternity. And there's some of you sitting here that you and I both ought to be ashamed that we don't share the gospel enough. We play at it. Where will you spend eternity? Do you know Jesus? Not just know His name. Are you in a relationship with Him or does that need to get better? I, I, I know I'm saved, preacher, but I'll tell you, I, I don't live for Him like I should. You can change that. Why, why would you go on and keep living that way when you can change your life? You know, the greatest peace that passeth all understanding is when you get right with the Lord. What do you need to do with Jesus today? So we sing what number, John? Number 307.